So we have here Gamla Stad, the old town of uh, Stockholm, with all the cobble streets. Actually, as a mathematician, we can solve this problem very quickly in a very beautiful way. Matthias, look at me when you speak. A shift or a gabija. I'm not completely sure if uh, everyone knows uh, this. Uh, um, I but... don't. What? I don't. Oh no, see? Yeah. Sorry, where's it Nancy? Okay. <laughs> 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 this must be too hard. Hi all. As you know, I think a lot about the problem of sharing the beauty of map with the general audience. And very often the beauty of map is represented in map museums or in YouTube videos via things like fractals, polygons, various algebraic surfaces of symmetric shapes and um, other things like that. So the word beauty is taken in its direct meaning and refers to aesthetical pleasure. However, mathematicians use the word beautiful when referring to many other things besides aesthetics. For example, the word beautiful in the context of math can mean unexpected, counterintuitive, weird, um, with many connections, simple and other things. And if we don't specify this, then I think it can be quite confusing because when you uh, hear that a dress or even a poem is beautiful and you ask why, you don't expect to hear an answer. Oh, because it's so weird. And since I believe that clarifying these additional meanings of uh, the concept of beauty in mathematics is an important necessary step in order to share that beauty, I made a small experiment. I was on a research program in the Mitte Glossar Institute in November. See the video about the oldest math institute in the world. And I asked my colleagues, who are all algebraic geometrists, to tell in five minutes for a general audience their stories of examples of the beauty of mathematics. So tell about some object or mathematical statement that they would use in order to demonstrate the beauty of mathematics. So in this video, you will uh, see their stories and I encourage you to uh, try to understand why my colleagues found them beautiful. And while the stories they independently chose are all from different parts of mathematics, I think one can see, even in this small sample, certain common aspects of mathematical beauty, which, uh, as I expected, are not directly related to pure aesthetics. And I hope you enjoy the stories, and of course you're welcome to write your favorite examples of the beauty of math in the comments below. Enjoy! So maybe let me begin with a question, and, and this, you know, I, I can't claim to, to, to know the history of this problem, I'm sure it goes by classical antiquity. Um, which integers can be written as a sum of two squares? Maybe let's just look at some examples really quickly. Um, so, so, you know, 1 will equal 1 squared plus 0 squared, 2 will equal 1 squared plus 1 squared, 3 somehow can't be done. Okay, so, so one can, can continue this way, and uh, we can ask ourselves, so is there, is there even an adequate, is there somehow a satisfying answer to this question? So let me, let me begin with the answer, with the answer and uh, except where is the eraser? It's behind this. Thing. Oh no, see? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it seems like, yeah, there are some integers that, that can be written as a sum of two squares and there are others that can't. And, uh, you know, at least the first time I saw this, I, I didn't think there'd be any reason why there'd be some sort of nice answer. So, so let me just focus, first of all, just, you know, I want to make this, this talk sort of as digestible as possible. So let's actually talk about primes. And um, th this turns out to be sort of the key, the key case to look at. And 
Uh, I'm also going to look at odd primes because we just saw that two can be written. And of course, let's just recall that a prime number is a is a is an integer that that can't be broken up into smaller pieces. It's only divisible by one and itself. And so answer um, an odd prime p equals x squared plus y squared for x y integers if and only if p is congruent to one mod four. Okay. So that means if you divide it by four, you get a remainder of one. But so, so this is just, just a statement already, I think, is, is, is quite nice because it's very surprising. I mean, to me, the question itself is not so interesting. Um, and even, even uh, I, I find the answer, I find that, you know, if there is an answer, um, the only reason it's interesting is because that there's, there's, some, there's obviously something going on here. There's like structure. And so let me, let's talk about that structure. All right, so it turns out that, that uh, the proof that, that, really, that, really, that I really enjoyed involved number rings, okay? So, so these, are, these are, one can really think of them as generalizations of the ring, so they're, they're called rings of integers. We're gonna take Z, the prototypical ring of integers, and adjoin uh, I, the square root of negative one, okay? So, so this is an example of, of a number ring. Okay, where k equals q adjoin i. It's two-dimensional vector space over q. All you're doing is adding this, this root of negative one. Okay, and so it turns out that what happens, the, 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 what, what makes a prime number being able to, what, what allows a, a prime number to be written as a sum of two squares is exactly how it behaves when you pass to this ring. When you extend, consider, P and G adjoin I. And then I can ask, actually, here, does P remain prime? And exactly when it doesn't remain prime, that's when it can be written as the sum of two squares. It's not just surprising, it, it also tells you something about, about the structure, not just of the integers, but the integers is just one instance of, of a whole range of, of new rings, these algebraic objects. And um, this, you know, I define what a prime is. Actually, one has to be a little more careful when you define what it means to be prime. But it, it, still, I can, I can ask whether or not P remains indecomposable, irreducible, rather. And that's exactly what, it turns out that when you're asking this question, you're actually just secretly asking the same question about how this prime behaves in this ring. Okay, so let me just like quickly uh, um, say where the parity uh, comes from. So, uh, so, Consider P in here, and so if we want to understand, so when is Z adjoin I over P? So, so this is you know, going to be some um, two-dimensional FP vector space. It, it turns out that, that the structure of this as a vector space over FP is uh, is exactly determined by. Um, the, the, the congruence uh, class of P modulo four because of how I behaves under the Frobenius morphism. But um, I'll, just, I'll just stop there. To conclude, what is the, the if you were like summarize, why do you like this uh, result so much? I think the question seems kind of, okay, I don't wanna, I don't wanna offend anyone, but I, I find, you know, asking, uh, are there solutions to this, you know, Diophantine equation by itself is not so interesting, but um, it turns out that hidden in those questions are often structural results. So I think one, the answer is surprising, and that's something because there's obviously structure there, and and then it allows you to reveal that structure, uh, and and I think that's what that's what I find very interesting about this is is this question about can you solve this Diophantine equation for some prime is is really a question about how this prime behaves. It's, an, it's really an algebraic question about how this, how this prime behaves when you pass to a larger ring. So I want to talk about early neuron cycles in graphs. So the starting point is uh, uh, in the legend about the town, the town of Königsberg, the town of Kaliningrad. And so there were two islands with some bridges in that shape. 
Okay. We had that, so we had two islands and seven bridges between them. So the question was, can we walk between the islands and use each bridge exactly once, um, and then coming back our our starting point? And well, people were trying to do it, but uh, they were always blocked and they were wondering why. So they asked uh, Euler, to how, so how should they do it? And well, Euler proved that it was actually impossible. So uh, I actually I don't want to use Königsberg. I want to use Stockholm because we also have a lot of islands and a lot, a lot of bridges. So let me draw a different map. <laughs> <laughs> so we have here Gamla Stad, the old town of uh, Stockholm, with all the cobbled streets. Then we have Sudaman here, and there's Kungsholmen, and then we have the mainland with the the main part of Stockholm here, and also the south part, which is also a mainland. So we will walk along the islands. So maybe we can start here. We can cross one bridge, then another bridge. Then we go here, we come back, and we go up here. And then if we come here, we see we are stuck because we have no bridge left, but we still have some bridge here unused. So that's annoying. And also, we didn't end up in our starting point. So we have two problems, and why do we keep having those problems? Now the idea is to simplify the situation, we don't need to have all the islands and all the bridges, but we will just draw what's called a graph. Okay, so now we draw a graph uh, uh, with uh, the bridges and the mainland, and forget the rest. So let's yeah, we'll just draw it here. Uh, I hope I have everything, it should be good. So now the situation is if we use, for example, the bridge here and the bridge here, then we can't use them anymore. And we've passed through the point here, we've used two bridges, so we can't use them anymore and we've reduced by two. So then at the end, we want to have zero bridges left, so all the numbers should be zero. But since we only reduce two by two, we need to start with an even number of bridges at each vertex, so that at the end we, we end up at zero. Also, the beautiful thing is, as soon as we have an even number of bridges at each vertex, we can find a, a cycle that goes through each bridge exactly once. Cool, so why do you like this particular problem so much? <laughs> mm, well, from, I would say because it's a, well, it's a very simple answer. It's a, it's quite a powerful thing to find, and it's a very simple condition to check. And also, it's uh, it started a whole new, um, a whole new topic in mathematics, the topic of graph theory. So exactly, study the the spaces with the edges and vertices between them, and what can we say about them? you about my favorite object in mathematics. I learned about this subject when I was an undergrad student and it's very beautiful for me because it was the definition that made me study uh, algebraic geometry and uh, well this object is ships and I like this object because it's a very nice way that usually when we want to study some geometric um, space and some geometric information, we uh, give a partition of this um, geometric space and to each piece of this partition or covering we associate certain information. And, um, and in this partition we always have intersections. And in these intersections, in order to make it this coherent, we would like that the information that we are receiving here and the information that we are receiving here is the same in the intersection. I also like this um, object because um, the way to encode this definition, it's a 
very nice abstract way to encode the definition of a ship. So we have uh, that in this abstract formulation, we're saying that if we have two ways to give an information, we will write that the information in the intersection is exactly the same. And I also like this um, the, um, concept because the name, it's a very weird word in any language that we are working. For example, when I was studying this, um, I was studying this in Spanish, and the word for this is gavilla. It was the first time that I heard about this word, and a shift or a gavilla is uh, something very agricultural, <laughs> something very agricultural, and um, so usually when we have wheat, wheat is correct word, when we have several stocks <laughs> on some agricultural product, <laughs> we try to, to put it all together in order to make it really well. So we are shipifying in this thing. And here is the painting of the shipifying woman. Yes, so this is actually a quite simple puzzle, which many of you might know already, but I think it's a very good puzzle to demonstrate what, what mathematics is about. And well, when people ask me what do I do as a mathematician, I usually tell them this puzzle, um, although maybe it's uh, not directly related to what I do in my research. but. Um, I think it's, it's very nice. So when I heard this argument the first time, I really found it quite beautiful. So the puzzle goes as follows. We have some eight times eight square, like, like a chessboard. Um, and now we remove two opposite edges of this board, uh, two opposite squares of this board, um, like that. So we have So we have 62 tiles, and now um, the task is to fill the spot by at least one by two tiles. So no two tiles should overlap and everything should be filled out. So we try to tile it, and since we have 62 tiles, it should be possible to tile it with 31 bricks. So then if you start to, to tile the spot somehow with these 31 bricks, no matter how you start, you will eventually find out, well, it doesn't work out properly. I mean, at the end, now I cannot finish anymore. That's bad. But maybe I, I just started the wrong way. Maybe there is some possibility. And the problem is that there are so many possibilities how to tile it that we can never know whether it's possible or not just by trying with ourselves. I mean, we could try this with a computer, but even that would take a very long time. Then if you increase the number of tiles, maybe even a computer can never decide that question. Actually, as a mathematician, we can solve this problem very quickly in a very beautiful way. Matthias, look at me when you speak, please. Okay. And this is a very elegant idea. So what we do is actually we color the spot. You know, this is a chess, a chess spot, so it has like black and white tiles. And you think, what does this have to do with the problem? The colors of the tiles doesn't matter at all. But the observation is every brick covers exactly one white and one black tile, no matter whether it's horizontal or vertical. So if you have 31 bricks, then they cover 31 
black and 31 uh, white tiles. But look, we have removed two black tiles. So there are 30 uh, black and 32 white tiles. So it's impossible to, to solve this task. And I think this is a very nice argument because with one simple observation, we can we can show that none of these uh, huge possibilities how to start are, will actually ever work out. They will always remain uh, more white than black tiles, so it's not possible. And I think yeah, this is a very very nice argument which demonstrates maybe a bit what, ma what mathematics is about. It's of course a lot different than what I do in my research, but it's I think closer to my research than what many people learn at school. So this has nothing to do with calculus. This is just about finding uh, nice arguments. So why, um, why do you particularly like this argument? Um, well, there are, are many reasons. So for example, um, I like that the... But yes, look at me, stop <laughs> <Okay. from it>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I like that the usage of, of the coloring of the board is very unexpected. I mean, the, the check board has this coloring, but, but it doesn't matter at all to the problem you first think. So, in fact, that this actually solves the problem, I think, is uh, fascinating. So I'm not completely sure if uh, everyone knows uh, this, uh, um, I but... Don't. What? I don't. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, you know, the usual Fermat uh, last theorem um, uh, also holds for polynomials. So the statement is that um, for n is at least 3, there are no uh, non-trivial solutions to the Fermat equation, uh, where these uh, P, Q, and L are they? They are polynomials with complex coefficients. And uh, and here we have to sort of uh, exclude these trivial solutions where where all of these polynomials are proportional. I mean, they're just scalar multiples of the, the same polynomial. Um, and uh, we again have to restrict to um, n is at least three, because for for n equals two, we do have sort of Pythagorean uh, triples. All right, so let's try to prove the statement. And this is a statement that's much easier to prove than usual for mass uh, last year. It's very geometric, which is something I like. Um, so if we assume that such uh, polynomials do exist, so we're assuming that the theorem is false, uh, then we can use these polynomials to define a map from the complex numbers to, um, well, C2, and we send T to these uh, ratios here. So if this equation here is satisfied, if we divide by our t on both sides, we see that the image of this is contained in this uh, curve here. We have a map from the uh, complex numbers, which is a two-dimensional object, and uh, the image is a curve, which we um, can also think about as a two-dimensional object just living inside this four-dimensional space uh, C2. And it's a sort of a general fact uh, when you have a map like this that you, you, can, uh, um, you can compactify and basically our map gives rise to a map between, well, two geometric shapes. One is the two-sphere, um, which you see here, um, and, uh, and this other shape, which is basically what this uh, two-dimensional um, space looks like. It, um, yeah, it's sort of a pretzel-like uh, uh, surface uh, with uh, many holes. And uh, how many holes do we have? Well, this has uh, 
n minus 1 times n minus 2 over 2 um, poles. So here we need the assumption that uh, n is at least 3, so there's, there's at least one hole in this thing. And then it's sort of intuitive that, that no such map should exist. Um, basically, the intuition is that, well, while you have these holes in this, uh, this uh, object, um, and uh, yeah, if you have take a loop uh, going around this, uh, this hole, well, because this map here is subjective, um, you can basically prove that uh, you get a contradiction, because here you can sort of contract any loop uh, to a point, but, but here you cannot contract this to a point. So this is sort of an impossible topological uh, situation, and then therefore um, we got a contradiction, and then, um, yeah, the original problem uh, didn't have any solution. So, uh, could you say a couple of words on why do you like this particular statement and its proof so much? Well, I like the statement a lot because um, it's a very basic illustration of something uh, um, deeper in mathematics, namely that there are analogies between uh, you know, integers and, and complex curves, which uh, look like this. So, so questions about uh, arithmetics or um, well, number theory um, have sort of analogies in, in complex geometry, and then you can sort of go back and forth between the two uh, subjects. Um, but I also really just like the, uh, the proof. So it's a statement about uh, polynomials. Uh, you start with some equation, and then you ask whether that equation has solutions uh, if in polynomials. But the proof itself does not really use polynomials uh, at all. In the end, it was really geometry that you know, gave us the, the actual proof. Um, if we just uh, set up this map, um, it was the fact that you had uh, you know, a, a geometric shape like this with many holes. That, that was really where the contradiction came in. So I really like the fact that uh, you know, geometry and topology had sort of implications for, for number theory. I would like to tell you about one of the very first mathematical statements that I learned outside the school curriculum. So something which was exotic and new. And the statement um, that I learned so long ago, it still surprises me to this day. And uh, the statement is as follows. So, let me call it a theorem. The theorem says the following thing, that um, there is the same amount of rational numbers as natural numbers. So if I write it in a shorter way, it says that... What is the word for this? Cardinality? Yeah. <laughs> that the cardinality of um, the set of rational numbers is the same as the cardinality of the set of natural numbers. But cardinality is just a fancy word for counting how many elements a set has. So how many numbers there are. And uh, the surprising part is that uh, natural numbers are clearly a subset of rational numbers because every rational number is uh, a fraction. So clearly there, there should be many more rational numbers than natural numbers. However, there is this claim. And um, the proof is rather easy, although the statement may be surprising when you see it the first time. So um, I'll tell you the proof. as follows. So in order to show the statement, it is enough to uh, create a bijection between these two sets, which means we want to enumerate uh, all the rational numbers by natural numbers, so that uh, we use all the natural numbers and every rational number gets a number. And um, it is enough to uh, look only at non-negative rational numbers and uh, even uh, natural numbers in order to simplify our lives. And uh, so we will just uh, enumerate them. Um, by hand. And uh, to do so, let me first write out all the 
uh, non-negative pressure numbers because you know we have just five minutes, so manage. So let's see. Uh, I would start with zero, and then uh, all the uh, non-negative fractions can be written in such a way. So there is one, uh, let's say one half, one third, and so on. And then I can take uh, fractions that are two divided by something. So two divided by one, two divided by two, two divided by three, and so on. And this way I can go uh, in both directions. Uh, so each row uh, looks similar to each other. So I just uh, change the numerator. And uh, if I continue doing it, I will uh, write out all the non-negative fractional numbers. Um, it's just that in, in both directions we have infinitely many of them. Okay, so uh, every rational number is somewhere in this infinite chart. And uh, now what's left to do is to enumerate them by natural numbers. And let me take another chalk and start enumerating them with even natural numbers. So I will enumerate 0 by 0, and then uh, this will be, let's say, 2. And then uh, I will go in such a way that I want to cover all the uh, numbers in this infinite chart. So I will start going like this, say 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, and so on, maybe I don't know. Uh, sorry, where did Nancy? Okay, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> 8, 10, 12. Yes, I think I can try again. Say uh, 8, um, sorry. 8, 10, uh, 12. <laughs> this math is too hard. Uh, okay, so 2, 4, 6, 8, uh, 10, 12, and so on. I keep going uh, throughout this chart so that uh, each number um, gets uh, covered at some point. So I, start, I started here, and then I went like this, uh, here, uh, down, then up diagonally, and then I would go you know, horizontally, then diagonally down, and so on, um, I, would, I would keep going in such a way. And um, this is a proof because it's an algorithm that shows how to um, uh, associate to each uh, non-negative rational number and an even natural number, such that each of them gets covered and um, now no one is left out. So this is a proof, we have proved it. Why do I like uh, this uh, statement so much? The reason is that um, I figured uh, over the years that for me personally the most exciting um, things in math are abstract counterintuitive ideas. So when you first see a result and you cannot possibly believe this could be true and then it takes you a while to reflect on it and uh, realize that it could actually possibly be true and then the next step is to have a proof and explain why is it true. But this uh, first step from dis uh, disbelief uh, to uh, a realization that this could make sense uh, is usually a very um, is a precious feeling, and um, yeah, this is what I personally enjoy perhaps the most, and uh, this is what this result shows as an example. Thank you for your attention.